Chapter 4, Mishnah 10. This Mishnah cites four disputes between Beis Shammai and Beis Hillel about various unrelated matters. The first, which also appears in, Kedusha, in Kedusubos 5.6, is about a husband's obligation to satisfy his wife's conjugal needs. If one makes a vow that prevents his wife from engaging in marital relations, Beis Shammai say that the limit is two weeks, whereas Beis Hillel say that the limit is one week. If the vow prohibits marital relations for less than the stated limit, namely two weeks according to Beis Shammai, one week according to Beis Hillel, the wife cannot demand a divorce. But if the length of the prohibition exceeds the limit, she can demand a divorce and collect her ksuba. The second dispute is found in Keraisos 1.6. After a woman gives birth or miscarries, she undergoes a period of tuma, when marital relations are prohibited, following a per- period of tahara when marital relations are biblically permitted even if she sees blood. If the child was a boy, the Tame period lasts 7 days and the Tara period lasts 23 days. If the child was a girl, the Tame period lasts 14 days and the Tara period lasts 66 days. After the Tara period, she brings a pair of offerings, Leviticus 12 verses 1 through 8. In the case of a girl where the Tara period lasts 66 days, it is possible for the woman to conceive and miscarry a real fetus, i.e., one that is at least 40 days old during the Tahar period. If that happens, she does not have to bring a second set of offerings. The offerings brought for the first birth or miscarriage are valid for the second one as well. If, however, the miscarriage occurs after the Tahar period, a new set of offerings is required. The Mishnah discusses a miscarriage that took place on the night that follows the last day of the Tahar period. Since the Tahar period ends on the 80th day from birth, after 14 days of Tuma and 66 days of Tahara, the following night is the night of the 81st day. If she miscarries during the night of the 81st day, Beisham, I rule that she is not obligated to bring a second set of offerings. Even in this case, the offerings for the first birth or miscarriage are valid for the second one as well. Since she miscarried before it was possible for her to bring the offerings, because offerings are not brought at night, the miscarriage is treated as though it occurred within the Tower period and thus does not require its own set of offerings. But Beis Hillel ruled that she is obligated to bring a second set of offerings, because in fact the miscarriage took place after the Tahar period ended. The third dispute concerns tzitzis, the fringes that must be attached to a four-cornered garment. The Torah commands that tzitzis include threads colored with a special blue dye known as techelis. These blue threads have to be wool. Therefore, if the garment is made of linen, wearing it with tzitzis would violate the law of shotness, which forbids one to wear a mixture of wool and linen, Leviticus 19.19, Deuteronomy 22.11. According to biblical law, the mitzvah overrides the prohibition. Therefore, even a linen garment must, garment must have tzitzis attached to it. The mission discusses how rabbinic law treats the situation. Regarding the question of whether a linen cloak is subject to the mitzvah of tzitzis, they shamai rule that it is exempt from the mitzvah. Thus, it is forbidden to attach techelis to a linen garment, for since there is no mitzvah, the prohibition of shotness takes effect. According to Beis Shammai, the rabbis decreed that tzitzis may not be attached to a linen garment because they were concerned that someone might wear the garment at night when the mitzvah of tzitzis does not apply and thereby violate the prohibition of shotness. But Beis Hillel ruled that a linen cloak is subject to the mitzvah of tzitzis, which is in fact the biblical law, because they maintain that the rabbis made no such decree. The fourth dispute, which appears in Masoros 4.2, is about tevel, i.e. produce of Eretz Yisrael, from which the required tithes, teramos and maestros, have not been separated. Eating tevel is forbidden. However, produce does not attain the status of tevel until the owner becomes obligated to tithe it. Before then, one may eat some of the produce as a snack, though not as part of a regular meal. Various circumstances make produce subject to the tithing obligation. One of these circumstances is Shabbos, that is, produce becomes subject to the tithing obligation at the start of the first Shabbos after it is fully processed. Thus, Processed produce may not be eaten on that first Shabbos or later, even as a snack, unless it is tithed first. Our Mishnah considers whether designating produce for consumption on Shabbos makes it subject to the tithing obligation even before Shabbos begins. A basket of fruit that one designated to be eaten on Shabbos, Beis Shammai rule that it does not become subject to the tithing obligation until Shabbos begins. One may therefore eat it as a snack before Shabbos without separating the tithes but Beis Hill a rule that it becomes subject to the tithing obligation as soon as it is designated. Thus, even before Shabbos, it may not be eaten at all, unless it is tithed first.